Hi, everybody. Um, I think we'll get started now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, it's really great to see all of you here and to be able to share some of the work that we're doing through the Laurier Centre for Sustainable Food Systems. Uh, it's a uh, Wilfrid Laurier University Research Centre uh, that's um, located here at the Balsillie School for International Affairs. And uh, we have many different facets to our research project and even Andre are here to share one of those aspects with you. Um, they're partners um, with the center and they're also partners with um, a grant that we have called Food Locally Embedded Globally Engaged uh, which is known as FLEDGE and that uh, partnership has seven research nodes across Canada and three international working groups so its reach is quite extensive and it reaches into Brazil. So we're really excited to have Ivan Andre here to share some of their amazing work with you. Um, just before we get started. Not that one, but yeah. Ah, right, sorry. Thank you. I don't want to mess up your slides. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. Thanks. Okay, um, so the center has been around um, since uh, 2013. So we're going into uh, year six or seven now, too many to count. <laughs> and uh, this is something that we do on a regular basis. We usually have um, one or two talks a semester. And uh, we're really delighted to be able to share, as I said, the work that even Andre are doing. But before I um, give you an introduction to them, I'd just like to point out our podcast that was launched in September. We now have two podcast episodes up um, for you to listen to. And we're really excited to share this with everybody. Um, it's gotten a lot of great uptake so far. Uh, the first episode talks about sustainable food systems and contextualizes things. And the second episode looks at different ways of thinking about and measuring uh, sustainable food systems and features one of our uh, co-researchers who works down in New York City and the way that he links um, policy at the um, national and state level with what's happening in the city of New York. So you should check those out. They're really uh, interesting and, and we're excited about the series. It's really super. So um, what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, both of our speakers today. So first of all, uh, Dr. Andre uh, Eduardo Biscaya de, de la Cerda um, is the manager at the Embrapa Research Station in Quesador. Um, and he's also a research scientist with Embrapa Forestry. Uh, Andre has worked for 15 years in ecology and forestry research. He's conducted multidisciplinary projects on many topics that are very integrative, um, that include biodiversity, sustainable forest management, genetics, and community-based agroforestry. Uh, he's currently leading several research projects in southern Brazil, and um, they're really wonderful and inspirational. So uh, I'm glad that you're going to get to hear about them uh, firsthand. Um, and these projects explore complementary aspects of applied ecology and national, natural resource management. So they really look at things in a big picture kind of way and bring a lens to the idea of agroforestry that um, is not necessarily typical. Uh, Dr. Lacerda's long-term engagement with local communities has led to many productive partnerships and research outcomes, including uh, the Casador Model Forest that's been uh, elaborated in collaboration with um, the Center for Education and Development of Urba Mate, which uh, is known affectionately as Sederva. <laughs> and, um, a collaborative, this is a collaborative effort to develop networks of knowledge and uh, around traditional urban mate agroforestry systems. So they work very closely with community partners, as, as you'll hear as part of this project. Uh, Andre's team is developing research and outreach projects to enhance biodiversity, uh, restore ecological functions, and develop innovative ways of using forest species as an alternative source of income for landowners, which is a really important thing in the current context because farmers are looking for ways to be good stewards of the land, but they also have to be economically viable, and Andre's work is supporting those initiatives. Uh, we also have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Evelyn Nemo with us today. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History at the State University of Ponta Grassa. 
And uh, Eve brings a very multidisciplinary research perspective to the table. She's also a professional editor and translator. She received uh, her PhD in historical, ar sorry, archaeology from the University of Reading in the UK, um, and is currently based in Brazil, working as a postdoctoral fellow uh, at uh, the State University of Ponta Grassa, as I said. Um, her research experience and interests include history and archaeology of Spanish colonial religious communities, uh, community-based approaches to environmental history, and also uh, conservation. And within all of that sort of big umbrella historical context, she explores issues around gender, identity, and hybridity in relation to the construction and use of traditional uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And it's really fascinating to hear the work that she's doing because what she's able to do is intersect with um, the work that's happening on the ground and really animate the, the historical context for the important work that's happening in through agroforestry um, in the areas that they work with. So along with a team from UEPG uh, specializing in environmental oral history. She's currently working with Embrapa to document traditional knowledge, uh, life histories and memory related to ethnobotany and the traditional production of herba mate in Aracaria forests in southern Brazil. Uh, Dr. Nemo is also affiliated with the Paranese Museum, the State Museum in Curitiba, Brazil, and is president of the NGO Sederva. So, uh, Eve and Andre are going to present their work to us together, and uh, please help me welcome them. I think you should come up here too. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Allison, for inviting us. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to come back to a place that I worked for a little while uh, and share the work that we're doing that we've been de developing together. Um, and it's, it's always exciting to, to present the work that we do to people who don't know the context and don't really have the background, especially because, you know, Canada and Brazil are, are so far apart. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of give you a an overview of the work that we've been doing together uh, as researchers looking at cultural history, uh, anthropological approaches to agroforestry, Andre's work with ecology, agroforestry, because um, we're really trying to create a project that is very multidisciplinary in a real sense. So, you know, we're not just researching two sides of, of one phenomenon. We're actually trying to integrate the knowledge that's in a way that, that is meaningful for the communities that we work with. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a background about uh, kind of the history of Erva Mate, and we work best if we talk together, so <laughs> um, we're not going to be very formal in how we, we do this presentation. But um, uh, so one of the, the um, right, so okay, uh, Embrapa Forestry, uh, Embrapa Florestas, which is where Andre works, um, just to give you a background there, is uh, the government research agency for agriculture and forestry in Brazil. Uh, so it's a national um, organization, a national company, um, and he's been working there for 15 years now? 18 years. 18 years, okay. Um, Siderva, which is the Center for uh, Development and Education of Traditional Systems of Erva Mate, it is the center that we developed through the work that we've been doing. Uh, it's an NGO, um, and the role of this NGO is has been to uh, kind of consolidate information and bring different actors within this network that we have together to work together. So we, we really envisioned it as a... Um, a kind of uh, facilitating organization that brings together knowledge, uh, uh, participatory action research, institutions, um, policy makers, etc. And Laurier obviously has been uh, a very uh, important uh, partner and supporter of our work. And Fitrafi Panana is one of our major partners in Brazil, who is um, the Federation of Family Farmers Unions uh, in southern southern Brazil or all of Brazil. Southern in southern Brazil. Um, and so they have been a, a very important supporter of our work. Um, and obviously, through them and through the context that we have made through the community members, um, they, they have opened doors to us that might not necessarily be open as researchers from institutions. Um, so working with family farmers unions has been a, a, um, a huge benefit, both to the farmers and to our work. You can talk about the forest. <laughs> so just. Oh, wait, I didn't do this one. Okay. 
Okay. So just to give you an overview uh, about where you're working. So we are working, as we said, in, I guess that's this one? Yeah. So Brazil, we are working in, in south of the country, really near Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. So it's uh, in a temporary or a subtropical part of the country. All the area where we work is above 800, 900 meters above the sea level. So it's cooler than the tropical Brazil. We have kind of this weather in the winter. So it's our coldest days like we have right now. Uh, so it's just to you know, explain that it's not like jungle, Amazon. So uh, as you can see here in this picture, this is the Araucaga 4. This is the Araucaga tree, which is the symbol or the most prominent uh, and iconic tree in the region. Uh, where everywhere you go, there you see this tree and like really marks the landscape. Uh, and because of that, the forest is called Araucaga forest, as we we call it there. Uh, it's a conifer, which is for Brazil very unique. Most of the other trees are not. Uh, conifers. So we have this mix of tropical and subtropical or temperate species. Um, also, it's important that uh, this forest only happens in this region, very, very small area of the country or the world. Um, specifically, this species is occurs only here in a little bit of Argentina and a little bit of Paraguay. Uh, and because it's a very tall, awesome wood, it has been devastated in the 19th century, basically. So nowadays we see just a little bit of forest left. Um, like the real big trees are all gone, mo apart from where I work and some little uh, other uh, areas. Uh, and because of this unique biome, this mix of uh, tropical and temperate uh, species, it's a very is a considered a hot spot, biodiversity hot spot, uh, because of the number of species they only occur there. Um, and as I was mentioning, large deforestation has happened, uh, starting with the colonization of the the, the region. So basically what happened is the, starting with the Spanish and then with the Portuguese and then the immigrants from mostly Europe, uh, they want to settle, they need to start planting some like crops and etc. and the forest was kind of a problem. So they basically start to get rid of the forest to clear the land and have an, uh, an area to plant. So uh, nowadays we have, as we say, one, four, one percent of this forest left, like the pristine forest is kind of gone, uh, apart from some protected areas. And, but after this deforestation uh, and together with very strict rules or environmental laws, some more, some forests have been uh, restored naturally. So we have like 20, 25% of new forests, secondary forests there now. So let's, I guess, oh, and here I can see, and the screen is more difficult. So there is, it's supposed to be like a circle. So in this area is where those traditional systems of forest production uh, take place. Uh, so not necessarily the whole south of Brazil where this tree grows is where those traditional systems take place. Like more intensively. So let me see what we have here. I can talk a little bit this. So, uh, you have to oh, I have to change here. There are two things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, what is yerba mate or yerba mate in Spanish or has mate? Have anyone ever tried it before just to, yes? Okay. So there okay. Is <laughs> okay. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, erva mate is a species called Ilex paraguardiensis. Uh, is a plant from the holy, holy family. Holy family. Uh, 
Um, it only happens in south of Brazil, and it's a tea that is consumed uh, in the whole south of Brazil, Paraguay, mm. Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile. Um, using this gourd and this, this straw, this is how you do, which is very similar how uh, the indigenous communities used to do in the past. So the, the gourds are kind of still the same type, but then, you know, they used like uh, used to use bamboos instead of uh, metal uh, source. Um, so the is a is unique to this forest, as I was mentioning. As m most of the species they occur there, uh, is a tree, um, like up to 30, 40 meters high. Nowadays, it's been it's been cultivated as a kind of a bush, like two, three meters but it, it gets to a very tall tree um, and is something that we haven't discussed. And you asked me, I remember, when you were in Brazil. Uh, it has many uh, uh, components that are interesting for uh, our health. Mm. So it has been um, analyzed and now we know that there is some lots of vitamins and this antioxidant, um, fatty acids, flavonoids, all those things that I don't know very well, but you know, I read that there's some 150 something components. Wow. They're good. Uh, the tea, the, the black tea has 120, so we have more there. <laughs> uh, and it uh, is not really my field of work, but I've been checking a lot or doing reviews about the work on the species in terms of uh, for health and pharmacology and med medicine. So I have found many works saying that is a very, uh, is some benefits as for cognitive function, is good for diabetes, for cholesterol, lowering cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, increasing the good cholesterol, for osteoporosis, blood pressure, so people, it's kind of magical. <laughs> so let's see what we have here. That's your part. Okay. Um, so I just to to go back. Can I go back? Yes, you can. Uh, the reason why um, this tree is important, really, in the forested context, is because it grows in the understory. So it's not one of the trees that generally goes to the top of the canopy. It's a shade tolerant species, right? Which is very important as to how it fits into agroforestry systems. So that's just an important thing we wanted to point out um, that traditional systems um, today exist uh, within forested environments, which is why there's so much forest in the, the areas, the regions that we work. Um, so as Andre mentioned, the, um, the way, oops, oh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, wrong button. Um, the way the tea is consumed in the gourd with uh, the silver straw, it really hasn't changed much since, um, well, for the last thousand years, basically. Uh, when the Spanish arrived um, in the uh, 16th century, because um, southern Brazil was first colonized by the Spanish uh, before the Portuguese arrived. Um, and when the Spanish came, there were the indigenous communities, the indigenous people there were consuming erva mate as with the gourd, with the bamboo straw. And this became a, a commodity within the Spanish, um, within the Spanish uh, colonial region there in, in most of this was Paraguay, because um, uh, Southern Brazil didn't exist at that, that moment. Um, so there is a very long history of cultural and environmental uh, interaction that has to do with this plant. Um, not only because the indigenous people were consuming the erva mate, but they were also managing the forest as well. And so there's uh, archaeological evidence and also linguistic evidence showing that um, the indigenous communities knew where the secondary forests were after they did clear cutting. Um, they would maintain the area after it was left fallow to for the trees to grow back and they would co go back to those areas to harvest um, native fruit species um, as well as erva mate. Um, and so there was a, a very obvious uh, uh, understanding of the forest environment and a management of the forest environment. And there's actually been recent research done in Brazil on 
the the existence of Arakatia forests and the and their interaction with um, indigenous peoples, showing that. Um, the Avocadia forest exists in some places because indigenous people were there. So it's a very clear interaction. There was a very clear uh, management of, of how those, those forest environments um, exist today and existed in the past. And actually, one thing that hasn't been published yet, but I spoke to an archaeologist um, who's working in the region, he found that pollen from Ervamate only occurs in some pollen cores after um, indigenous people started living in that area. So, you know, it's, there's very clear connections between people managing the forest um, and, and the species that exist there. Uh, so you can see in this map here, this is the, the natural incidence of aromate as a species. Um, and in the colonial period, Asuncion was the major hub, was the major center where uh, the aromate was, was um, shipped to. And the Jesuits are very much involved in this whole process as well because they, uh, colonized, the Jesuit missions colonized much of this region, and Aromata became a, a very uh, important commodity for them to sell to maintain uh, the mission sites. And so some of my research has looked at um, the hybridity of the knowledge between processing the Aromata and consuming the Aromata, and eventually the Jesuits figured out how to uh, cultivate Aromata. And so there was no cultivation uh, of the species by the indigenous people until the Jesuits arrived. And then it took them a long time, about 100 years to figure it out. But eventually they did figure out how to plant Aromate. And so they had actually had Aromate stands around some of the missions. Once the Jesuits were kicked out in 1767, that technology disappeared. And it didn't actually come back until in Argentina until 19, about 1910, and in Brazil until the end of, it was about the 1970s, 1980s. They actually started to plant and cultivate erba mate. Most of the exploitation of erba mate um, was based on uh, natural stands, right? So the forested environment maintained these trees for all those hundreds of years. Um, and this is actually this photo of the Sheta. He is um, processing yerba mate uh, with the leaves you can see here um, on the bottom. And he's using like a mano and matate system to grind them after they're toasted. And so the whole process of toasting, um, roasting the leaves, consuming it is very much an indigenous technology that hasn't changed really significantly uh, since colonization. Um, so the southern Brazil was, became really part of Brazil at the end of the 18th century, um, but it wasn't until the, about the 19th century, the mid-19th century, that uh, settler communities began to, to settle in these regions. So European colonization really reached um, this region of Brazil. Um, and most of these uh, settler communities were from Western Europe. Most of the indigenous people, because of the colonial uh, um, policies and Republican policies wiped out a lot of indigenous communities. Um, in these unoccupied regions, they used to call them, there were communities of caboclos living, which were people of mixed descent between Portuguese, uh, Spanish, and indigenous, um, that continued to live in kind of the southern Brazilian region where we work, but they weren't really integrated into the kind of the Brazilian colonial, or the, the, um, the yeah, the Brazilian system. So there was a, um, at the, in the mid-19th century, there was a, a policy to start occupying these unoccupied regions with uh, settlers from Western Europe. And so uh, their first economic boom that occurred um, in much of the, the commodity agriculture that was happening at that point uh, was because of erba mate. And they learned, the settlers learned this, um, these activities, how to process the erba mate, where to collect it, what the tree looks like from the indigenous communities or the, the, the um, mixed descent people who were living in these regions at the time. So the, the communities that we work with, most of them are descendants of these first settlers. So they're often Ukrainian, German, Italian, um, Polish. There's a, a, an interesting mix of, of Western, or sorry, Eastern Europe. Um, oh, I got that wrong. <laughs> uh, Eastern uh, European influences. Um, and they trace the knowledge of the forest back to those original settlers. And so when we're talking about traditional knowledge, um, the documentation of, of traditional knowledge, we are working with settler communities. 
And I realized that the, in, in some situations, traditional knowledge is seen as an indigenous knowledge, but these, it, it, it can be defined as well as, as knowledge that um, comes from communities that have existed in an environment and passed on that knowledge from generation to generation. And to them, their cultural identity is very much tied up with that environment. And so traditional knowledge, we're looking at it from the sense of, of these communities that have been there for, for 150 years. <laughs> so to continue to give like uh, a context of where we're working, um, so the the farmers, uh, they are our partners, are the typical type of farmers that we have in south southern of the of the country. Uh, they are small scale, which in Brazil small scale means mostly less than 50 hectares, the size of a property. Uh, and actually there is a legal classification for that in, for, in terms of uh, loans from the government. So it, it's why most of them are less than 50 hectares. Um, and exactly where, well, I'm going to show better where they are. Uh, what is interesting is that although most of the commodity production of Brazil is based on soy and meat, for instance. Uh, food, really, uh, is based on small-scale farming. Um, so there's this difference of um, the, how much we get in terms of exportation value and what we eat. Uh, although the government really focus on exporting or the exportation, uh, we eat really what small-scale farmers produce. Um, there is a lot of pressure to move from, um, first of all, to sell properties and move to the cities. And it has been this since the 1920s, but really picked up in the 50s and is still going on. We are moving towards having like three quarters of the population in rural, uh, in urban environments. Most or almost all cities are really along the coast, like Rio and Sao Paulo, etc. cetera. Um, but also a lot of pressure for them to move from their systems of uh, agricultural system to monocultures. So not only in terms of how you get uh, uh, credit from the government, but also um, even the institutions like mine or the outreach institution, the government outreach institutions, they really go to the farms and say, well, what you have been do you've been doing is kind of something from the past, we need to move to Modern. like modernize, industrialize, soy production, you know, more and more and more and more pr production, uh, which creates kind of a animosity. People don't, or farmers, a lot of farmers don't trust out, outreach and research institutions because they have had uh, a lot of bad experiences. Because, you know, when you get, a lot of uh, research has been done uh, Brazil in the last 30, 40 years has like increased production per area like five fold, five times. So we are good in industrial and uh, in commodity farming, uh, but they took those types of farming and tried to implement in very small scale farming and it kind of didn't work obviously uh, because you, you need like big harvesters, big equipment, a lot of fertilization, etc., and, and people don't have this equipment for just to start with. Um, so they are feeling really, the farmers are feeling like out of the system and, and that's, that's a big problem. Um, so in the area we are working, there is a lot of, is a mosaic of different land uses. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, cattle, uh, livestock production, erva mate, forest, uh, with or without uh, erva mate, uh, and of course crop production. So, uh, and farmers, although they are in a small scale, they don't, not, they don't depend usually on one type of production. They have like various types, milk, uh, uh, cattle for, 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 uh, for meat, uh, erva mate is always there, sometimes not the important, sometimes the most important type, but is always there. 
uh, honey and soy and beans. So they, they kind of do a little bit of everything. Uh, but in this all context, we, it's important to mention that for most, we have very, it's kind of funny to say that, cor uh, currently. currently is even more kind of <laughs> interesting, that Brazil has very strict uh, environmental laws. It's very, very strict. Uh, not everybody really abide, but that's not, it's beyond the topic. Uh, so, the f these laws regarding forest are so strict that you basically cannot cut a, a single tree anywhere in the country without a permit. A permit. Even if you're a farmer and you have a forest, you cannot cut a tree unless you have a formal authorization. And of, you know, as you can imagine, that big farms that produce thousands of uh, big farms with thousands of hectares of soy, they have already the forest, everything, and you know they don't need, have the forest problem anymore. But the small scale farms, they have trees, a forest with Aramati, because Aramati needs forest, like shade environment, they keep the forest. If they need wood for firewood, it's a problem. They might get a fine. Uh, so what happens is that they feel very disproportionately affected by these laws that they are protecting the forest, but they cannot use them. And the ones that have the money enough to clear the forest and pay for the, pay the fines that they get if they forest, they don't, they don't care. It's, it's not a problem. So it's a very complicated situation uh, in which you protect the forest, but the law only kind of is, applies to you. It's more or less what they have told us most of the time. Uh, so with this forest that are left in, in these properties, uh, actually it's important to say that these laws in Brazil require that uh, every single property in South of Brazil must have 20% of its area with forest. And every single river and uh, spring must be protected as well with forests. Uh, and when we have a lot of springs and rivers and forests, it sometimes means that 70-80% of the property of a small scale farmer is untouchable. Uh, unless you are a big farmer, then you just clear and <laughs> everything is, you know. Uh, so it is very complicated and we face this all the time. Uh, the problem of how to deal with the law that does not allow you to, well, use the, the, the land basically. Um, and the traditional systems are there using the forest for a long time. So they, it's a very complicated situation for, let's say for me as a practitioner, a forester, they want to develop productive systems in the forest, within a, a forest environment. And we are always in, like, in this edge of being legal or not legal. So it's kind of complicated uh, context. So just briefly to show what has happened. You know, it's here. Uh, so this is an image, a uh, satellite imagery from 1969 showing what, oh, so this is south in Brazil. Here is Argentina and Paraguay. We can see here on the coast this is a bit darker, so it's supposed to be greener, so it's uh, darker. And we see darker area here as well, which is the Iguazu Falls National Park. So basically, these are the two biggest areas with forest in the, in the region. And we have a little bit of darker area here, is, which is darker means forest, is exactly where the, far, uh, the this traditional Aramati traditional systems take place. Uh, so the rest here is, was, okay, <laughs> 500 years ago, this is all, was all green, completely green. So in 1969, this is what was the situation. When you move forward in time, now we're 1985, you can see again the same pattern, green here, because this is all uh, 
natural reserves, protected areas. Again, the national park in here, a bit greener. And then you can move forward in time again. So we are in 2016, exactly the same. So just to show that how uh, traditional systems over time has helped to protect forest cover in the, in the region. And this is my research station down there. So just to give you like an image of how this area or the landscape looks like here. Wait, I'm looking here. Uh, this is all the region, like all central Brazil is like that. So no trees, no 20% required, etc. I mean, the 20% requirement is still in, in place, but nobody cares. Uh, here in this region where I was showing, there is a little bit more forest cover. You see this mosaic. So uh, green, of course, is kind of forest uh, cover, and whatever is light green is different types of use, usually crops. And then a little bit out of this region, you see some forest and way more and uh, crops as a land use in the region. So just to give you uh, these good pictures. Mm. Okay. Sure. Um, so the traditional systems that we work with, uh, as you can, as you saw from the, the previous images, have been very important to maintain forest cover um, in this region. Um, but as Andre said before, that these farms are not just aromatic production systems. They are um, a mosaic of usually crops. Uh, there's usually a garden that the woman of the household takes care of. Um, there's usually livestock. Um, there's a kind of a, it's an integrated system usually on, on many of these small scale farms and a lot of them are committed to kind of organic agroecological production. And this comes from living in the forest, living in the region, uh, having this traditional knowledge that's been passed down for generations. And also, like Andre said, there's been tensions between um, the institutions that have showed up and, and, and pressured them to, to switch to monocultures, such as tobacco, soy, corn, um, and moving away, having switched to those systems, moving back again towards more agroecological production because of high incidences of cancer, birth defects, and we've had, we've done interviews with people and they, they have specifically said that they stopped planting tobacco because you know, their son was born with uh, microcephalitis or something. And so, you know, they're, they're, they see the effects of the, 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 um, the pesticides, the chemicals, the fertilizers that they uh, are, in some ways are, are, are um, pushed to use in these more monocultural systems. And so the uh, aromate system is, is, is not a standard. It is a very much um, a kind of variable system. What matters most is that the, there is forest cover, right? And so often there will be um, a more closed system where you've got the erva mate in kind of a natural forested environment um, with the, the larger trees over top, which is usually quite dense and it's um, very shaded. And it, it, there's a range. So it goes to, to a very open system with, um, with cattle or, or pigs. Uh, and then some in between. But the point is, is that even within one farm, it can be variable across all of these things. Um, but what's interesting is, is that they, the, the, the farmers that we work with are very, um, they're interested in maintaining that forest cover because they understand that without the trees, there would be no clean water, that it's ecosystem services that is offering um, uh, the community, the region, et cetera. Um, and some of these systems, um, have their collective systems actually they're 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 managed in a sort of commons and so well, there's two different kinds of, of, of kind of a commons that are, are um, used with erba mate one is called fascinal which is uh, groups of families have collectively pooled their land um, and the livestock is just um, um, what's the word free ranged um, within the forest. And so they'll have pigs uh, with the erba mate with the forest and then the crops 
that all the families also have are the bits that are fenced, right? And so the rest of the community is is open for free range. Um, there's the another system called a kaiva, which you can see. Uh, oops, pressing the wrong buttons. So this is called a, uh, an open kaiva, where it's usually a cattle system, um, but the the cows are are pastured underneath the erba, erba mate systems that are a little bit higher, so the cows don't don't eat the erba mate trees. Um, but the point is, is that it's uh, very highly diverse. It, most of these these farms are very highly diverse, and. I think that we can see them as subsistence farms first. So they feed the family first before they sell um, um, beyond the farm. And one thing that I heard a lot in the interviews that we've done is, is the, the farmers often say that no one ever goes hungry on the farm because uh, they have a system in place, the gardens, the, the livestock, the crops that feed the family, right? And then beyond that, that's, um, and the Erva Mate actually is, is often thought of as a, uh, kind of like their piggy bank or their their bank account, their savings account. Because you, with the traditional system, you generally harvest once every three to four years, which is the same system that the indigenous people used um, 500 years ago. Because um, the tree regrows within five within three years, um, you get kind of the resprouting that you see on these trees here, right? So you can kind of prune most of the tree. Three years later, you'll have a new harvest, right? So a lot of families think of it as with their son or their daughter needs to pay tuition for a year, they'll harvest a bit of the aromate, or they need to make a, an investment, um, need to pay off a debt. The aromate becomes that, that, uh, that resource for the family. Um, so just, I know there's a lot of people who like to talk about policy. <laughs> so I wanted to include this slide um, just to give you kind of a, a, a context of, of the types of policies that are supporting um, uh, agroecological production in the region that we work. So some of you might be in a, familiar with the, the Food in Schools program in Brazil that has it's actually been very successful and a very um, well-known system. It's, oops, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so uh, the Food in Schools program has been around since the 1950s. It was instituted in Brazil to make sure that children um, did not go hungry when they went to school. Uh, that's the PNAE. P -N -A -E. Um, and that system with the previous government um, got a lot more important because there was more of investment in small scale producers and agroecological and organic producers. So there was a certain percent, I think it was 30%, had to come from small scale um, agroecological or organic production. And all that food went to the schools, right? There was another program or is another program called the um, uh, the food acquisition program that was a similar type of system to the food in schools program but that was meant to, to support hospitals, daycares, other government institutions um, which have been very very successful but one of the problems with small-scale farmers is that they couldn't um, feed or they couldn't meet the needs of these programs for the communities right because they're all small farms that don't produce enough on the single farm to to get contracts with the, the schools or the, or the um, the municipalities. So many communities have come together to create co uh, cooperatives to put in contracts or to get contracts with these these um, uh, food in schools and the and the the food acquisition program, which has been very successful. And a lot of farmers have um, increased their garden production. It's been very successful. It's brought a lot more income into the communities. But there has been problems with the current government. Um, the the food acquisition program, I think, is basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, and there has been issues with the policy being applied in that the contracts that the, the cooperatives signed with the government um, had to be followed to the T, which doesn't work with agricultural production, right? So they had to have a certain number of bushels of corn, of cabbage of carrots, if the crop didn't work that way, they were substituting. The attorney general went through some of these things, put some people in jail, said that they were um, uh, embezzling funds, that they weren't fulfilling the contract. So there's a very significant disconnect between like how the policy plays out on the ground and the way it's envisioned um, by the government. Um, Andre already talked a little bit about the forest code. Do you want to talk more about that? Okay, so the, there's just an image here that kind of um, maps out what, he, what Andre was talking about, the, the legal reserves, um, 
the forest code that, that governs you know, how you can use forests on the property. Um, how are we for time? I'm not really even paying attention. <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. Yeah, so just continue. Okay. Um, so our, uh, getting to the, to the research, but that's a, I mean, it's a big context that we have to provide because a lot of people are not very familiar with, with uh, the environment there. So the research, the, the research project that we're doing right now is that, um, we're taking a community-based approach. Um, and what we really wanted to do, and this is something that Andre and I had discussed uh, for years, because he's been working with, um, uh, you know, working on agroforestry systems, working in forestry for a long time, working with communities, um, but not ever having the kind of anthropological, sociological, uh, humanities, social sciences aspect of of the project or the researchers or that expertise to kind of create um, a dialogue with communities that that had a different perspective, right? So we, working with uh, his colleague Isabel, um, developed this kind of community-based approach um, because we realized that the farmers had, they have so much knowledge and we wanted to, to break that paradigm of the research institution going to the farm and telling the farmers what they should be doing we wanted them to tell us what they thought they should be doing um, and how we can integrate the knowledge that they have into productive systems that can be kind of expanded beyond just their own farm, right? Um, so the main goal, the one thing we really want to do is co-create and share knowledge. And that's been a huge focus of the work that we've been doing. So really focusing on traditional ecological knowledge as well as academic knowledge and making sure there's um, kind of a research um, the research is about sharing knowledge, uh, building community capacity. So, you know, having uh, meetings with communities, creating capacity within the communities to do kind of citizen science or to think about, you know, the, the work that we as researchers are doing, how that can be integrated into the farm and vice versa. And also leveraging grassroots initiatives. So one of the things that we've really found working with these farmers is that they're already doing really amazing things. The, like the communities that we're working with have um, been holding a, a heirloom seed fair for the last 17 years. They've been saving heirloom seeds and exchanging them for 17 years. Like this is something that's been going on for a long time and they're, they're very invested in this. They realize the importance of it. They don't want to buy Monsanto corn. They want the corn varieties that, you know, their grandmother or their great grandmother or, you know, generations that they've had on the farms. And so they have these, these exchanges, which are very important for community building and also very important for, for agricultural biodiversity. They've, they also have uh, cooperative initiatives, as I said, to meet the needs of, of the policies, um, uh, organic cooperatives that they've developed, and the unions, the family farmers unions have been very, very strong in these communities. Um, and so that creates more capacity within and knowledge for knowledge exchange. Um, and we're really trying to bridge the divide between research practice and policy. And that's one of the things that we have recognized is that the, the farmers often feel that they have no say especially when it comes to policy. Um, and the research that we're doing, we want to, to make that or, or document that data or, or have that data that we can, the farmers and us together can use to influence policy, right? So it's like creating that foundation, that, that informational foundation that can be used to influence practice and policy. And obviously, um, supporting and valuing the, the continuation of traditional agroecological practices, uh, cultural history, 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 and environmental patrimony. And one of the things that we did quite recently in September is um, we worked with, um, oh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but we, we developed sustainability indicators uh, with the community looking at the farms, the systems, the traditional aromatic systems, and thinking about what are the indicators that the farmers themselves think um, are the best way to determine whether these, whether these systems are sustainable or how to improve them. Um, so our focus has been on capturing food in environmental histories. So we're doing that through in, in, um, oral history interviews. Uh, documenting the memory and traditional knowledge uh, associated with the forest. And this often includes walking through the forest with the farmers, their families, talking about the grandmothers or the grandfathers, the 
medicinal plants, uh, how they've used the forest, the things they can do now, the things they can't do now, the, the tensions that they feel between uh, the institutions, other farmers, kind of the environment. Um, uh, creating awareness, we're also trying to create awareness about these local histories that the farmers themselves can use to market their own product. Because right now, erva mate that's produced in a traditional system doesn't really get much more value than an erva mate that's produced in a monoculture crop, which does exist, but it's very chemical intensive, it's very fertilizer intensive, and there's not a lot of value given to these systems, despite the fact that they're very important for the environment, for ecosystem services, to continue culture, et cetera. And also ensuring that there's uh, a sharing of this knowledge in these histories and traditions with the youth of the community, um, and, uh, and ensuring that women are involved in these conversations as well, which has been a, a huge um, uh, benefit, I think, and something we're really working on. And I was saying earlier today that we did an interview with uh, one farmer who's kind of a, a leader in, in these communities. And so we did a, an interview with his three kids who are in their 20s and uh, him and his wife. And we asked his wife, Veronica, you know, what her role in the whole process is about going to the meetings, etc. And she said, this is the first time he's ever invited me. And since then, she has been to every meeting. And I think it's just like they, they, they needed a, a catalyst to, to realize that, you know, the, the women's role in that family and that the, the decision making was just as important as, as um, the male. So, you know, those kinds of changes are, are very encouraging. Um, and one of the things that is bringing kind of these two sides together is that we're trying to incorporate the various perspectives of from these from these interviews into models of forest management right so we're thinking about um, gender about different ethnicities about different um, different communities and how they do things and how can we scale that to uh, or, or integrate that knowledge into models that can be replicated elsewhere um, and also creating knowledge and networks of knowledge, which has been very important for the farmers themselves and for the institutions that we work with. Um, often with research institutions, the researchers will show up on the farm, talk to the, the farmers about what they're doing, um, but there's not a lot of exchange between farmers. And so in the, the knowledge sharing um, uh, events that we've held, we've tried to bring farmers to different farms and they it kind of blows their minds in some way because they've never seen someone do some like the aromatic production in that similar way. They don't think it will work, but but there's a, a knowledge exchange. And the last event that we had when, when Allison and a few others came uh, down in September, there was a, a young man who was the son of, of um, uh, traditional farmers. And he was, he basically gave the tour of the farm. And during that discussion, there was another young farmer who was part of our group. And the discussion the two of them had was like, I mean, it was just incredible because they'd never met before. They were both farmers. They both uh, did agricultural production, but they'd never had that chance to interact in a way that was like talking about the forest, talking about the agroecology. And it was really powerful to watch. It was, it was very inspiring, I thought. Um, so that's been a huge um, focus of the research is is creating these environments to share knowledge and to share knowledge and practice between institutions, between institutions and farmers, without there being a hierarchy. Um, do you want me to continue? I guess I should continue with this. So uh, what we want to get of this is, is a deeper understanding of the cultural, social, and economic uh, values associated with forests. And like I said, knowledge about agroecological production in the family in these regions because um, the agricultural production is not something that's really come from outside. It's come from the grassroots initiatives, right? It's like the understanding of the environment that has really um, brought about these, these practices. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, it's obvious to a lot of people who work with participatory and community-based research, um, but I think it's important to recognize that the producers are not separate from their environment, right? They're active agents um, and participants in their environment. They understand their environment. Oops, sorry, I'm forgetting about the slides. Um, 
And the interviews and the narratives that, that we're documenting are really starting to illuminate the underlying power relations that exist um, between institutions uh, and researchers. Um, and that there is, a, a, there is a negotiation or a management, an interpretation of kind of the, the information that comes from institutions to the farm. Like they filter and take what they want from it. And I think that that's really important for, for uh, researchers to, to recognize, right? So the co-creation of knowledge really becomes um, a very important aspect uh, of the work. Enough out of me. You need water? <laughs> so just to uh, give some examples of what Eva was talking about in terms of uh, what we've been learning, you know, as co-creation, I guess, we are learning on the go. Uh, although Isabel and other, uh, other researchers have been working with these communities for more than like 20, 25 years. Um, there are some examples that were quite interesting. It made us realize that maybe you need to kind of uh, value what we're trying to do, but actually understanding that people maybe were not taking the, uh, or using the best approach. When we went to, uh, one of the farms, um, one of the, the, per, the people there said, oh, because I was bringing p farmers to different other farms to see what's going on. And she said, oh, it's amazing to see what others are doing. And then what we're thinking is like, okay, we as researchers always go to one farm and see, and they show us. And then we go to another farm and they we see, and then we go to another one and we learn, but they don't talk to each other. <laughs> and so it's very interesting to allow them to interact more uh, directly and learn from um, or an exchange between or among themselves. That was very interesting. It was kind of a eureka moment to me because, you know, it, it is important. Uh, another thing is engaging with policy makers. Uh, and it has been since I started working in forestry like 25 years ago. It was, it was always been this thing. Uh, environmental agency or those people that don't understand what is going on in the field and just want to give ticket or find people they don't know what's going on is a problem is a problem is a problem and then the farmers on the other hand well they kind of think the same because they are just there and they just come by to say oh that's wrong you have a fine and regardless of what the farmers tell them look what we do is we know what you're doing. And they say, no, <laughs> that's wrong. And then we start talking to them, the, the, the environmental agencies, and like very slowly, and then uh, being out there all the time in these meetings, sometimes it's very boring with environmental agencies, etc. And then like by talking, like, oh, why, I, I ask them, why you do this? Why you, how do you see this kind of practice in the, you know, in a farm, it's like, oh, if they go there and uh, cut bamboos in the forest, we have lots of bamboos, Clara knows a lot about that. Uh, I get, and the answer was, I, I give a ticket because it's against the law. I was like, oh, okay, so, but do you know that it's a problem when bamboo becomes invasive? Um, they said, oh, is it? And then I start explaining and they, the, that you know, sometimes you need to go there and manage these bamboos so the forest can uh, continue to grow, etc. And the person said, oh, do you have a publication about it? I said, okay, you're here, I got my phone, and send the person straight away. And the person, 15 minutes after in the coffee break, was talking to another farmer and they start talking about bamboos and then he started talking to the person how it's important to manage bamboos. That was absolutely crazy. So it's like, okay, those hard data pub publications are really important because they don't value the farmer's knowledge. They, far, they, they value like the scientific community mm -hmm. stuff. So, and then it continues in our meeting in, at the UFRO is the, uh, what was last month? I don't know. Yeah. It's like, uh, in Curitiba, it was the biggest forest uh, congress in the world. And then the same people that I've been talking to show up in our, in our presentation, the three of them. 
I was like, okay, so they start l listening. So I can use, as a government institution, I can leverage my position to publish things, and they l listen, they start to listen. So now uh, we're going to have a meeting in December, early December, in which we're going to have a, a round table with the environmental agencies, and they're going to talk among themselves about how they're going to deal with this practice. And this is, we've been trying to do something about it for so long. It's a revolution. And it suddenly, <laughs> it felt, well, nothing has changed. But I mean, it has changed in terms that now they are listening and they are willing to visit what we're doing. They went to my, to this place here, the research station, and to see our, exper our experiences, our, you know, the practices that we're trying to show and create, so they start listening. And sometimes you just need to, you know, connect people, and it was pretty interesting. So, you know, just to give some examples, because I think it was very, very important. So, back to our presentation. Uh, one of the other things we're doing uh, is testing and disseminating uh, models of a productive restoration. So that's a name they gave to it, it's a productive restoration. Uh, we can call it agroforestry if you want. Uh, and, but I use that on purpose because I want to highlight that you can restore, you can produce. So people don't think that, oh, it's a forest. And then therefore, in Brazil, mindset, forest means no touching. So, okay, we are restoring. We are, pro it's a productive system. And if you want to see as a, any, as a, uh, any other crop, it, that's fine. I, you know, as long as you understand uh, the, the concept. So what we've been doing is we've been to the, so this is, uh, of course, aerial view of the uh, area that we've been restoring, like 15 hectares, in which we're, the, each of these areas here are different agroforest systems that we're, we're testing, uh, different models. Uh, and these models are based on what, what, a little bit of what I know and a little bit of what people in the farms are saying that they are interested. Uh, so fortunately, those things are kind of you know, talk, talking to each other very well. So what uh, my plan was, OK, how can I make forest or trees interesting in a farm again? Because people sometimes they don't want trees anymore. Because if a tree grows, they cannot cut. So you see a seedling? I cut it because, you know, I got rid of a, a future problem, which is very counterproductive, to say the least. So it's a, or a lack of a, a losing, a missing a opportunity. So what we've been thinking is something that is easy to implement. So many exper experiences in uh, environmental, uh, in research institutions, outreach ones, creating these awesome models to produce, go to the farmers and say, look, wow, this is beautiful. This is our uh, recipe. Follow it. And it's very complicated. No, people just look like garbage. Because they, you know, it's too complicated. So it, it must be easy. It must be fast. OK, trees take some time. So it's not like a soy production that every year you harvest. But you know, try to make it a little bit faster if you're necessary. So instead of planting trees that will take 100 years for you to grow or to harvest some from it, what about starting with ones that in five years you can harvest something? And then we can move on to more diverse uh, uh, systems. So, and of course, they must be look lucrative. They must provide something out of that. So you wanna, because in, most of the times in Brazil is, you need to restore something, okay, you spend your money to buy seedlings, fertilizer, fence it, well, the labor, and maintain that for 20 years and, until the forest is back and you cannot even touch that forest. So it's like, you know, nobody is going to do that. And of course, nobody has done. Uh, but sometimes they get fines. 
So what about make it profitable? You restore making some money, which, you know, finally, even the environmental agencies are kind of, okay, it's not a big deal. And it must be re replicable. So you can do this in various different scenarios, big farms, small farms, with tractors, without tractors, it doesn't matter. You can do this in five by five meters or 100 hectares. So uh, again, just to tell you that this is, we wanted to increase forest cover, but also uh, take into account agroforestry systems, but you know, take into consideration that people might must be interested and make money out of that. So another thing that we've been doing is, I, I hope you can kind of understand there, so is we're uh, in the areas that, so in those areas here, we also uh, introduce erva mate, because it's obviously the biggest uh, crop we can have. Uh, but also there are some areas in, like forested areas, they are kind of degraded. This is all completely full of bamboos, uh, and we got rid of them. Actually, this is a wall of bamboo back there. So we, well, we cut the bamboos and start planting erva mate and manage the forest here, kind of quietly, because, you know. <laughs> it's, an experiment. it's an experiment. We can, as experiment as science, we can do that, but it's always like a bit, you know, you never know. So. Here, here is the the, the erva mate plants. So we're, most of them are kept lower so we can harvest easier. Uh, but some, you know, this is more or less what we see. This is a replication of a, a traditional system. Of course, it changes because forests change, but this is more or less what you would expect in a, in a, in a forest there, in a traditional system. But this is a research, research station. So that's interesting to kind of replicate. And this is another example of uh, forest restoration. So this is, was a, a soy production like a few years back. And now we are introducing, we introduce pioneer species that grow very fast. Three years they produce a 10 meter high canopy, uh, which provides the shade for the erva mate that is planted here to grow better. So this is uh, one example that you can restore and produce. It takes like five years. Uh, you will be, will be profitable in eight, but you know, there's no magic there. Trees take some time to grow, but it, you can do that uh, without much difficulty. And another, another thing that we're doing is improving practice and techniques in farms. So we have the aspect of testing things in the research station. So the idea is that I can be kind of a bit, a bit crazy, do whatever I think, you know, exaggerating a little bit, but you know, there's no pressure or less pressure for me to test something. And if something goes wrong, you know, is in a research station. Because I, I have a problem with what well, I've seen before, you testing something very interesting that some research that came up with, and testing a farmer that you ask the person to stop producing something in this area, and then you implement something there, it goes wrong, and the person's, you know, you know is, a, is a problem. So we're um, uh, testing in our farms, but we're also testing with the farmers something that they, we ask, what you need, which direction we should go in our research. So in this case here is a, this caiva, this is kind of a forest, it, uh, it's a forest with cattle production for milk. And one of the biggest problems here is that during the winter, as you can see, there is nothing for the cows to eat. So we've been testing uh, different types of, of grass that will grow in a little bit more shaded environments and in the winter. Uh, and in this case here, it's working very, it's working fine. The milk production increased four times, and you know the the income increased. The, that farm is the milk is the main source of production, so basically increasing four times. Now they have a car, they have a tractor. It really changed the life of this family. So again, just to whoop, no, it's, it's here. 
co-creation of knowledge. Uh, this is another example, like a farmer and Isabel here, we go to the field uh, in a farm and ask what, what our problems are, what they think we should do, uh, and you know, you try to, it, it must be relevant, what do you do, what your research is. And you know, we need to solve problems. So we nothing better than go there and ask them what they think uh, or what they need. So th this is really important for for our research. And you know, always uh, having meetings and trying to discuss in groups what to do and uh, next steps. So. So just to briefly wrap up, um, what are kind of the outcomes that are coming out of this research? Uh, first of all, we're identifying potential forms of community resilience uh, to environmental ch to environmental change, um, which is one of the, the biggest issues that these communities are, are facing. They, they know that the environment is changing. They know that their, their forests, their, their farms are important for ecosystem services. So how can we support those kind of um, ways of, of creating community resilience. And also social innovation to create increase value, to create um, awareness about the products that they're producing, the importance of these products, um, practices, the traditional knowledge. Um, and also we, we want to influence policy. And that's, as Andre said, you know, people from the environmental agencies are taking an interest in, in what we're doing and starting to have those conversations and, and creating that, uh, those connections between the farmers and the environmental agencies is very important. And I wanted to include this photo um, here because this is a, a, a gentleman that we did a, an interview with. He's about 80 years old. And he loves to wear this, this T-shirt because it says, only we can write our own history, which is you know, pretty beautiful. Because they have this awareness of the community that they live in, the, far the importance of their farming techniques, the agricultural practices. Um, and so we're, we really want to support that and, and continue that kind of um, that, that knowledge and understanding into future generations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was just fascinating and so rich. Um, I'd just like to ask for a point of clarification that sure. I may have missed, but um, people in the room might want to know about. Um, I know from reading some of your papers that there are measured environmental benefits in terms of water quality and biodiversity and things to the Herba Mate farming. Um, systems, the traditional systems. Can you speak about that a little bit? And then if you don't mind doing that, um, I don't know if you have that information that you can talk to, but then what we, I would love to do is open up um, to some questions from the floor, if that's okay. So um, there's a lot being said about the benefits of having a forest or uh, in general. Mm. So um, we currently, there's has been, this is complicated. Uh, so herba mate production in, in shade environments, in forest environments, has been, as we, as we discussed, uh, for a long time. But as part of uh, research institutions uh, context is like 10 years, more or less. In my company, herba mate has been uh, researched for the last 40 years. Uh, so it's reasonably new topic. Uh, you know, erva mate in uh, in a forest. Actually, I have colleagues they still say that this is not sustainable. It should be just abandoned and moved to something else. You know, because this is not sustainable. You don't produce enough. Um, that said, there is, there was one. We have currently one project looking at uh, benefits or the. Uh, the benefits of this kind of systems in terms of carbon sequestration, water quality, um, biodiversity, fauna and, and, and plants. So we are really in soil, um, soil, li soil life, my microfauna, micro microfauna. Mm -hmm. So there are several aspects being researched, but because it, this is kind of a new topic in yeah. even in my institutions, kind of. Yeah. Still some unknowns. Yeah. Okay. One of the farmers that we uh, we work with, he there was a, a survey done of his Herba Mate system, the forest, mm -hmm. I think about 15 years ago, 
10 or 15 years ago, and he said that um, they did a survey of the number of trees, and it was something like 148 trees, species, that they found within his Aromati system, which kind of the, in a untouched forest, it's usually, you know, a, between 150, 200 species. So it's pretty yeah, high diverse. biodiverse. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, that, thank you so much. That was just so wonderful. Um, does anybody have any questions for you and Andre? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, do we have a mic? Yeah. Thanks, Elena. Uh, just, can I get you to speak into the mic? Thank you. Hi, I'm wondering, um, in the context that you're in, uh, people who talk about forests, is there any discussion that maybe there could be uh, provided some kind of uh, financial pay to people who uh, simply have trees and leave them there? Because trees provide a product to the earth, of course, the uh, fresh air, the regeneration of the environment that is not paid. And when the data is considered, only the uh, commodities that are measured and sold as such are paid for. So why is maybe one of the most valuable things produced on the earth not getting any pay? Is there discussion of that that is practical? Um, there is interest. So uh, there are some several initiatives in mostly in at the municipal level, in which uh, usually the hydro company pays for some farmers to maintain forests close or, or along rivers or dams or uh, springs, but that is not a state or federal level initiative yet, uh, and mostly relate to water. Uh, and it's, so the payment for ecosystem services is uh, mostly driven by NGOs that convince somehow some municipality and hydro at the municipality to do something. Uh, there is a lot of talking, and I remember hearing about carbon sequestration and red plus mm -hmm. plus. Um, to me, is still like very far, mm -hmm. still. Uh, and interesting that because of the fires in the Amazon that everybody heard about it, the government decided to do something about, or the the not the government, the the Congress passed a law creating the uh, payment for ecosystem services policy which is the first step to allowing the, uh, this creation of the payment. Or, or the, you, must, you must create this very simple policy and then create the regulation. Otherwise, it's illegal to, for the government to put money on this thing. So we're moving a little bit towards that. But I have to say it's very slowly, like very, very slowly. But I agree, this should be done, yes. Thanks. That's just great. <laughs> it's really very exciting. I, I just have one um, reflection and question um, related to it. Um, one is, you know, all of this integration, farmer to farmer knowledge, academic community development of knowledge, and particularly the farmers in setting the research agenda feels really important. Um, so I just want to talk a little about the two things I heard that remind me of what we developed um, in the Toronto Food Policy Council strategically, because I think these are um, strategies that can be applicable in different contexts. Uh, so one is uh, what Wayne Roberts calls being a solutionary, <laughs> right? finding solutions uh, for bureaucrats more than for farmers. Uh, and it, it, what I heard was, in, especially in that example you gave, Andre, was how um, you know bureaucrats get stuck often in clicking boxes. So do the NGOs who contract with them, right? And the actual problem may get completely sidelined, like what do we want to have happen here? Do we want to have 
prosperous farmers? Do we want to have sustainable landscapes? You know, what do we want? But we've done what, our job and we'll get promoted and we get do all that stuff. And to get past that, to um, invite the farmers, the bureaucrats, sorry, uh, to, to see their work and get really engaged with it. I mean, that's really quite beautiful. And it takes a lot of personal engagement plus the research. So I just wanted to highlight that because I thought that was really great. The other is uh, the model building, whether you do it on experimental farms or working with particular farmers. Uh, Debbie Field of Food Share in Toronto often said, well, we build models and then we advocate for um, government to apply them, to turn them into general policy. And um, I think that's maybe relevant to what you're doing, and also uh, that you're integrating it with farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge. So if you have a farm that's succeeded and experiment there, um, it will certainly be noticed if you can make it noticed. So here's my question, though. Um, it's about um, the possibilities of information technology for the farmers themselves, particularly in setting the research agendas and in sharing knowledge. Um, and that is, you know, everybody can have a cell phone now. And it's not even very much money if somebody doesn't have one to get them one. And in that case, it ought to be possible for the farmers to define research problems that they can actually run themselves. I mean, whether it's an insect infestation or a marketing issue or any number of things, and actually have very, somebody, not very much, uh, coordination of that data and the feeding it back to people. So that would really be the question whether whether that's possible and whether it could actually shift the policy direction away from bureaucracy toward a more networked um, collaborative way of working. I mean that's very long range but if we don't have a long range goal in mind we can't easily pick the short range strategies or tactics. Um, thank you, Harriet. Uh, yes, there are so many possibilities, <laughs> and particularly with information technology. We, one of the things that when we were working with the, the farmers to develop the sustainability indicators, um, one of the challenges that they highlighted was communication. How do we communicate across, you know, because they're, they're communities that are, they're not very far apart, but they aren't necessarily easily accessible, right? Um, and there has not been a very good solution put forward so far. So right now we have groups on WhatsApp, uh, we have a Facebook group, but it's not really the right kind of platform. Um, and I don't, Right now, we don't have the manpower or the technology, like the, the, the expertise, to build something like that. And I think it, you're right. It is, it is the way that this kind of research should be going. And it should be uh, farmer-centered. And they should have um, kind of control over how the research agenda is, is put forward. And that discussion, you know, um, like you said, the infestation of a certain, uh, a certain pest what are other farmers doing? What's the strategies? Being able to communicate that um, quickly would be really, really beneficial because often they'll send a message to Andre and say, oh my God, I've got Impola. What do I do? And so, but if it's affecting one farm, it's affecting all of the farms, right? Um, but I don't think, like right now, we, we don't have, um, that's kind of a long-term uh, planning. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> we really want to do something like that, and we've been discussing. And uh, the Sederva, the the NGO that we created, was actually because of the we figured that uh, first of all, nobody knows about those agroforestry systems. So w how those uh, the products that come from those farms will be valued. Uh, or value at all, or value more, uh, if nobody knows. Like you know, people need to know that they do, and their products are somehow different to you know pay attention and go to a grocery store and buy them. And then we okay, so and then 
okay, we, we go to Google and like, um, what is agroforest systems in Evermite? There is nothing, like a little scatter around. So we thought that we need to have at least a website <laughs> where we can get information from it. So the Sederva was correct thinking like, like in this sense, and we create a website in, in our very amateur way, uh, and still a little bit amateur, I guess, but uh, we, yeah. we really know that we need to do that. We do this in our kind of spare time, and I don't have really the knowledge enough for doing something better. Uh, so there's some resources, like people helping. Uh, and it has been a problem because, for instance, we have this meeting in December or we had the meeting the other month and it's very confusing because lots of messages, people, uh, did you invite Andrea? No, like, I'm going to be the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because message, message here, one is WhatsApp, the other was an email and one refuses to have a cell phone, the other, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I know that's a really big issue. I think that actually there's a, a group of youth farmers who've gotten together, who've started meeting every month, oh. I think, or every couple of months, and I think this is something that we need to start talking to them about, because they're the ones who understand the technology better than the rest of us, um, and I think they're the ones who are going to share the information more so, right, than the the seventy year old farmers that uh, are yeah. terrified of a cell phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to give an example, the the family, the three siblings, uh, there is one WhatsApp uh, group? One group or for the whole family, and when I need to talk to the the father, the, the old man, uh, or he wants to talk to me, they ask the daughter to send me a message, and they send back, and then she chose him. So, so we need to talk to him, you know, take advantage of the willingness of the younger for to, to use those things, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Hello. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, the policy and kind of to piggyback maybe off a little bit of what Harriet was talking about. Um, and I'm wondering, are there avenues for farmers to influence policy directly? You, you gave the example of um, the talking with the bureaucrats that came to the community, um, and then also the example of the round table. Do you know if farmers will be at that round table, or if there's an appetite to bring them um, into those policy uh, processes? Yeah, so are there, yeah, are there avenues for um, farmers to influence policy directly? Um, specifically about this round table, the round table is in, uh, uh, um, Agroforestry, agroforestry production annual meeting, okay. which is the farmers' meeting. So we are putting, or we are helping to bring those people there. So they they will be uh, in a farmers' meeting. That that's why I think it's so interesting that yeah. we are bringing them instead mm -hmm. of you know uh, because usually the contact is just I give you a fine. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it was way better. Mm -hmm. uh, scenario but um to historically they haven't had much uh influence over policy because the most of the farmers that we work with are small-scale producers that are, are you know quite poor so there hasn't been access to um you know who do what who would i even talk to about that right like uh so traditionally or historically it's been there has been a very big divide between policymakers and small scale producers um, one of the initiatives that is coming to fruition uh, is we've recently uh, instituted an observatory which is basically a strategic council focused on traditional aromatic production um, and this is a kind of an agreement between the the small scale farmers unions the family farmers unions the uh, ministry of labor or the Attorney General of Labor, um, several NGOs, uh, several research institutions, and government agencies. 
And this um, observatory is really meant to um, kind of consolidate the information and support agroecological production of yerba mate in traditional systems. Uh, and it's, we just signed the document last month. So uh, we're all hoping that this will have some kind of political impact, right? And people are starting to take notice. Like um, a mayor of a town that produces yerba mate showed up to the meeting. He wasn't invited. Um, but he, uh, he wanted to sign the document. And the, uh, the attorney general said that we'll decide if he or if the municipality can sign but that's up to the farmers. That's up to the people who signed that document, who were there to sign that document. So it's, it's, there's a push to give power back or give power to, the, to kind of the, the, the small scale farmers, which is something that they've never had before. So it's pretty amazing, like, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's interesting or important to highlight that although and Brapa, like myself, and a few people from different institutions have been trying to bridge those divides between uh, environmental agencies and various uh, stakeholders, let's say. Uh, but it's always like this struggle because, uh, well, you know, we're going to talk about these farmers, these poor farmers. You, you know, people kind of look, because the federal government really wants, like, big production and we're talking about a lot of poor people so there is no much interest to you know to be clear um, but when we brought to the table and was for some reason like we are lucky when the attorney general came and became engaged the dynamic changed completely because uh, before we couldn't even talk to the mayor. Now the mayor came to talk and like, okay, let's see. He completely changed the, 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 the discussion. Yeah. So there is the, the, the power dynamic changed a lot. So having, there are some key players that sometimes are obvious, sometimes not the, uh, much, but they can change a lot, make a really huge difference. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and wonderful research with us. Is there, are there any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna ask if there's no other questions from the audience. Um, Harriet, would you be able to, or was, was that your question, your closing, I don't wanna. Yeah, okay. Okay, that'd be great. Um, and just to introduce, uh, Harriet. Um, Harriet Friedman is a professor emeritus who's with us today, um, and we're very grateful that she made time to be here. Um, she was in the sociology department at the University of Toronto, and she's really a, a leading thinker in food systems and has been doing this work um, very, uh, with so much integrity for the last many decades, and is really um, showing us the way in terms of how to integrate some of the bigger concepts and stepping back and asking really important conceptual and theoretical questions about work, but also does really important work on the ground. So over the years she's worked, as she referenced, um, with the Toronto Food Policy Council. Um, she's been a very big supporter in Toronto of Food Share as well. But she's also giving voice to many projects around the world that in her retirement she's become involved in. So we're really lucky to have her here to provide some um, summary thoughts and comments. So um, I hate to make it short, but we're getting a little bit short on time. So thanks, Harriet. Yeah, whatever you pr whatever works for you. Is that okay? Oh, does that work? Uh, that was a lovely introduction to me, thank you. Uh, my short job title since I retired is pollinator. So <laughs> I just go around doing that as an elder sort of thing. And um, thank you both for such an inspiring talk and I was really lucky to be able to visit um, some of the sites with Eva and Andre um, in, in Paranal. 
Um, so that was lovely. Now, uh, and to hear it updated here is very exciting. So I'll just highlight some themes that I think are important. One is academically or intellectually, they're integrating political economy with biocultural landscapes. And these are different disciplines that are struggling to try to come together. Similarly, uh, or in a parallel way, government agencies are silos. And that's what they're talking about encountering. I think anyone who's done any research trying to put together farming systems, family farms with uh, ecology, sustainability, and especially forests, will have come across these government silos and the roles given to, um, to those agencies which often exclude each other. We've inherited a very modernist paradigm. Forests aren't supposed to have agriculture, and agriculture aren't supposed to have trees, and there are many more things to say like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a challenge. The possible response they've offered us is, first of all, collaboration. So they themselves are representing EMBRAPA, a government research agency. Um, they've created a civil society organization. They have an international network which we're representing right here with uh, Allison's uh, inspired leadership, I would say. And, um, and then the farmers union, and that is more and more critical. The, the role of the farmers themselves coming forward and, and having their knowledge validated and coordinated which is a really great role for academics. Uh, and in this case, it's based, this research and this practice is based on um, a key crop. So um, it's like a keystone species, I think, in an agroecosystem. You've got a key crop in a mixed farming system. And it, it seems to me one way of trying to get through questions of measurement and all kinds of other questions that we're trying to bring in to have mixed farming systems validated, researched properly, and so on. And they're, they're very challenging problems, and it's, it's one way. Um, and the related to that, I just want to bring it up so we don't forget it, the land-based issues here. So having commons um, of some kind or another, they have traditional ones uh, that are very important and cooperatives as the, the social form. And that's really it. Um, they're doing some beautiful participatory research. And I think um, probably most of the people in the room already appreciate that and want to do it. And I, I think we, it's a, a beautiful example of giving us a model for how to do it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you, Harriet, for those great closing comments. Thank you, even Andre, for bringing us your story in such an honest and compelling and inspiring way. The work that you're doing is just really wonderful, and you're providing an example for many people and, and a way forward. And we just wanted to give you a tiny little gift from Canada <laughs> to take home with you. And thank you to everybody for being here and um, participating in uh, this afternoon, now evening's event. <laughs> and uh, we hope to see you back again um, another time. And uh, get in touch with us if you have any questions. And um, thanks for being here with us. We really appreciate your participation and your presence. So thank you so much. Thank you.